Hello everybody, this is Brother Tom welcoming you to another study in the Word. We're going to go and do our eighth teaching on the area of uh, the Apostles' ministry. But we were talking about bishops, we are talking about elders. These words are all interchangeable. And the word bishop and elder in the Bible actually uh, can mean a lot of different things. A lot of different ministry gifts, different uh, positions. And, uh, but we were talking specifically about these elders, how it developed. And what happened was when they went into a particular area and they started preaching the gospel, if the Apostle Paul stayed there, he could pastor that church for a season. But he also had to recognize eldership. And by that I mean maybe there was a Jewish person there that was a rabbi, let's say, and uh, uh, had a calling on him to teach the Word of God uh, in the church. Then Paul would have uh, brought them over into eldership because uh, they had already to a certain extent, they knew the word. They say just the common sense. If there wasn't somebody like that, then uh, the person to uh, to oversee uh, to a certain extent would be probably chosen by uh, an elder in the city, uh, possibly somebody that everybody knew that was a leader already. Um, normally, God would give you at least a few of those, I'm sure, uh, to start with, and they would be placed over to. To oversee uh, until uh, fivefold ministry gifts could be developed. Now, this is important to understand because the fivefold ministry gifts were not developed overnight. And so much of this elders being put in there uh, was that. And as the church grew, people went to Bible school, like in Ephesus and Antioch, uh, and developed ministries. They were sent out, I'm sure, or in a certain area developed uh, in. Uh, with like Paul in Ephesus where he stayed there three years and preached and preached and preached and preached to them so that they were they could be set over these churches these ministry gifts begin to develop and we need to understand that if you don't understand that then you're gonna you're gonna get some some faulty ideas about what the way the church should run today uh, when churches start today normally uh, as an example when I went and started my first church back in 1990 I'd been prepared by God and uh, I had, I'd been it's been about 10 years a preparation uh, uh, started out in helps ministry and worked uh, there for a while what moved you know did everything in a church I could do was faithful to the Lord to, to uh, serve another pastor and lead or learned a lot didn't know everything but I, I was far enough along to where the Lord said okay now you can go and you can oversee your own church I didn't need elders at that time I just needed me and my wife um, as we developed the church over a period of time we certainly recognize those among us that would hold those positions. But it took a while is what I'm saying. And uh, so today it's a little bit different in the sense that maybe people are prepared before they get into ministry. It's the way it's really supposed to be. But back then, of course, they had to do what they had to do at the time. So we see this development. Now, uh, a younger person can be an elder, spiritually speaking. And let, let me, let me uh, share with you why I believe that. Well, first of all, we're going to see in the scripture, if you turn to 2 Timothy chapter 1, that a younger man named Timothy was uh, placed by God over a church, the largest church of the time, called the Church of Ephesus, to be the spiritual overseer, the apostle or the pastor. Um, some people call him an apostle. Some people call him a pastor. I have a sense he probably had an apostolic call on him, much like Paul did. We do know, though, for a season, he pastored that large group of people uh, in Ephesus. And uh, people say, well, there's, the, uh, you know, the elders should all have the same amount of influence in making decisions. But the truth is that Paul wrote two epistles to Timothy, giving him instructions on what to tell them to do. And it's very clear that Timothy was in charge because one person needs to be in charge. So this idea of the plurality of the eldership that will come into the body of Christ through many different means, it, it, it comes, the, the plurality of elders what I'm talking about, it comes uh, in times of season through the body of Christ. And people go, get, you know, they get off into this. They're thinking, you know, you have to have five guys running the thing all on the same level. And that never works. I, I just have never seen that work. But it'll come. That's, that's air that comes every once in a while, just like air comes in the area of the apostle. Every church has to have an apostle or it's not a real church That's uh, that started it, that oversees it. That's just not right either. The pastor really is always going to be uh, the main overseer of churches. Now, there could be an apostle that oversees a church uh, or a group of churches even. 
that's all right. Uh, a, a, a pastor can be an apostle. A pastor can be a prophet too. That's all fine, and I know a lot of those. But I got to tell you this, for the most part, pastors are still going to be pastors. They're shepherds. They oversee the flock. And uh, so this is really uh, the development of the church. Now, in, in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 1, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, according to the promise of life, which is in Christ Jesus, to Timothy, my dearly beloved son, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank God whom I serve with my forefathers with a pure conscience that without ceasing I have remembered of thee in my uh, prayers night and day. Greatly desiring to see thee, being mindful of thy tears, that I might be filled with joy. When I call to remembrance the unfeign faith that was in me, which dwelt first in thy grandmother Lois and in thy mother Eunice, and I am persuaded that is in thee. Wherefore, I put thee in remembrance that thou stir up the gift of God, which is in thee by the putting on of my hands. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of the Lord, of me his prisoner, but thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God, who has saved us and called us with a holy calling. Okay, so here we see Paul sending a letter first exhorting his son Timothy, and in other places he told Timothy, do not let them despise thy youth. And then he instructed Timothy how he was to handle the elders, but Timothy was in charge. Clearly, Timothy had spent enough time with Paul to be a developed in the ministry gift, even though he's younger. So Timothy would have been uh, considered an elder uh, in the church, even though he was younger man than most uh, men that were in the ministry at that time, and probably a lot of them even today, because he had been a Christian his whole life. His grandmother had passed her Christianity on to her mother, and her mother had taught Timothy, and Timothy had apparently received the Lord very, very early in life, developed his, his, uh, his life, and then the Apostle Paul came into his life, recognized the call of God on young Timothy, and mentored him. So we see a ministry develop here that way. So even though somebody is not older, certainly if they have life experience, they have been taught properly, in the, in the right situation, can be considered what we would call an elder in the Bible, or an apostle, a prophet, evangelist, pastor, and teacher. Now take it, the apostle's office and the pastor's office are, are take longer to develop, but it's not a matter of age, it's just a matter of the right type of teaching and experiences given by God, and the, the right amount of mentoring and the, amount, the right amount of proving, and a person can be ready for that particular ministry. Now, let's take a, a, a look here in Re Revelations, just in a couple of scriptures, and I wanted to share that with you. Revelations chapter 4, and I think we'll read several verses of scripture here. Revelations chapter 4, verses 4 through 10. And around the throne were four and twenty seats. And upon the seats I saw four and twenty what? Elders, sitting clothed in white remnant. And they had the, be uh, the, the heads of cra uh, uh, crowns of gold. And out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices. And there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which were the seven spirits of God. And before the throne there was a sea of glass, like unto crystal. And in the midst of the throne, round about the throne, were four beasts full of eyes before the, and behind. And the first beast was like a lion, the second beast like a calf. The third beast, beast has a, uh, the face of a man. And the fourth beast was like a flying eagle. And the fourth beast had each of them six wings about him that were the eyes uh, within. And they rest not day and night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was, which is, and which is to come. And the beast gave glory and honor and thanks to him that sat on the throne, who liveth forever and ever. And the four and twenty elders fell down before him, that sat upon the throne and worshipped him, that uh, liveth forever and ever, and cast their crowns before them, saying, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they were created. So even in heaven, we see God has a uh, has elders, and these are, of course, probably going to be 
the 12 uh, apostles of the Lamb, as well as representatives from the Old Testament, and there's speculation on who they be. But the truth of the matter is, is that God is always going to have elders, even in heaven, in places, we have respect for eldership, and we need to understand that. So there we see that, and, and we also see it in the Revelations chapter 7, and uh, just to show you the scripture again, in verse 11 and 13. And the angels stood around about the throne and about the, uh, about the elders and the four beasts and uh, fell before the throne on their faces and worshiped God. And so we have we see the elders working there, worshiping God. And then verse 13, and one of the elders answered, saying unto me, What are these which are arrayed in white robes, and whence have they come? Okay, so we see the elders in heaven, interesting, during the uh, uh, time of the tribulation and, the, and uh, all of that. So we can see that elders uh, are a part of uh, God's thinking. Hallelujah. Uh, when looking at and understanding the role of elders uh, in the church, we must understand several things. And I want to go over some territory with you again. When the early church got started, many times, even though some of the some of these people would be called the, uh, the fivefold ministry gift, uh, it took time normally between 4 to 14 years, depending. Now, Paul was an example of that. It took him about 10 to 14 years. He operated as a course. He was in helps ministry. I'm sure he was helping, but he also taught as a prophet, but then he was releasing the fullness of his ministry, Acts chapter 13. But it took a while to develop that ministry, see. And while that ministry was going on, some of these churches that were being established out here, of course, you know, uh, by the development of these ministries, uh, must go on. So they put people over them that had some uh, role in being leaders. They put elders, maybe a city had, uh, already had elders in it. Again, I, 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 I want to emphasize that in some capacity, uh, used in responsibility of leading. People knew who they were. So it was uh, what wisdom to put them in charge of the church, to oversee the church, until the gifts could be developed. Some of the elders may have been called of God already. Having many uh, leadership skills in place would have been the wisdom of God to do that. But it's very clear in God's word that eventually, as churches like in Antioch and Ephesus grew, they became Bible training centers for the fivefold ministry gift. And uh, so that's the way that worked. Now, in Jerusalem, we see something happen here. I want you to go to Acts chapter 6 that I always point out because the way that the, ch the church was developing. So some of the scriptures that you see in the Bible, uh, especially if there's just one, one, one time that this happened, we don't understand and we, then we try to implement that one scripture or that one principle, <clears throat> excuse me, taking it really out of its setting and historically inaccurate in the way that they operated some of these things. And we try to apply it today, and it gets us in trouble. It has got people in trouble for years. And uh, because in Acts chapter 6, it's like this, verse 1. Now remember, this is, church is really just starting. It's just getting going. And in those days, when the number of disciples was multiplied, there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews because of their widows neglected in the daily administration. Then the twelve called the multitude of the disciples unto them and said, It is not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Good point. Verse 3. Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. So as the church developed, the apostles were doing all this themselves, and it became apparent to them that as, as the church grew, they couldn't handle it anymore by themselves. So it was wisdom that they would get other people to handle this. So what they did is they asked the people, the people out there that and they gave them some, some principles that the people needed to have, and they let the people choose. Now, this is the only time in the entire New Testament that you see <clears throat> God allowing people to choose. People get the idea that this is a principle in the Word of God, but it's not. Uh, nowhere else, anywhere in the New Testament epistles, do you see people choosing deacons, people choosing pastors, people choosing ministry gifts. This is not scriptural, ladies and gentlemen, to vote people in, to vote people out. And I'm going to show you why this was a problem from the beginning here. 
it sounded good and, and it was good. The principles they laid down of what, who they needed and what, what characteristics these men should have was really good. And they said, though, verse 5, and this saying pleased the whole multitude, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith, and the Holy Ghost, and Philip, and Procurius, and Nicorin, and Timon, and Parmenius, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch. Excuse me. Now, most of these men went on to do great things, became fivefold ministry gifts later on, after they had uh, uh, learned how to serve. But it's not, it's not true in every case. So even though they felt this was a good idea at the time, they found out later that this was not the way that God, in his wisdom, wanted them to handle choosing people. And we know this because, verse 6, whom they set before the apostles. They set these guys before the apostles. And when they had prayed, they laid hands on them. And the word of God increased, and the numbers of the disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly. And a great company of the priests were obedient to the faith. And stepping full of faith and power did great miracles among the people. Now, this all looks good, and, and it was. Uh, to a certain extent, it worked good. Stephen became a great man of God, some of these other guys, and of course we know about Philip who became a great evangelist. Um, we know uh, that through the scriptures, uh, some of these guys, uh, all of, almost all of them, we know from church history, became one way or another established in the church as leaders. Uh, so we see this, uh, this choosing. But the problem is that when they chose these men, the people chose them, kind of looking at them as maybe just with their personality, somebody they liked, whatever the case may be, thinking that uh, the people they chose were all okay. But this one man, Nicholas, he was not okay. He apparently didn't have good character. Uh, Nicholas was a person that was converted to Judaism out of the occult world. Then he was converted out of Judaism to Christianity. So he had a lot of baggage. Now, I'm not saying that that uh, disqualified him from anything, but it, it, it's interesting because he had a lot of baggage. And as the church grew and the apostles had laid hands on these men, it's important for you to understand that they put their stamp of approval on them. To a certain extent, the people looked at them then because the apostles were leaders, as, you know, they're leaders, and there was a certain amount of authority uh, given to them, and this Nicholas fellow took advantage of that, and people began to follow him. Now, it's really interesting that this, this, this trend always seems to happen uh, in ministry, when there's a move of God like this, anywhere in the world, actually, where you will see people, God raise up good, good preachers and elders, in a certain area, but there's always somebody, and Paul, the Apostle Paul warned about this in the last message we talked about, where uh, in Acts chapter 20, I think it is, where he had the, the minister's meeting. He said, when I leave, he says, uh, people from the outside are going to come in, and they're going to draw away disciples uh, unto themselves. And then he said, people sitting amongst you are going to rise up, draw away disciples unto themselves, twisting and perverting the message of the, God, the pureness of what I, I taught you. This happened. This man, Nicholas, because he had a lot of authority, took a large amount of people, split, the, split off from the church into a what we would call a sect or a cult. And it became what the Bible referred to as the Nicolaitans. And so let's go over to uh, Revelations chapter 2 and look at here it, when, when Jesus addresses the churches through uh, the Apostle John many years later now. The Apostle John, at that time, the last living apostle of the Lamb, an elder, he was very elderly when, when he wrote this on the island of Patmos. And we know that up to this time, from, from Acts chapter 6 until this time, never again did you see any uh, of the people get involved in choosing their leadership. Uh, and we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that in a minute. In a little while, all we saw was that when Paul wrote to Timothy, when Paul wrote to Titus, so on others, he talked about them choosing the leadership, the deacons, and so on, by proving, by watching over. Now, it's interesting because here in the book of Revelations, chapter 2, 
Jesus speaking to the churches says this about the church of Ephesus, whom Timothy pastored for a long time, then he was martyred, and then the Apostle John actually stepped in uh, and, and was there too, and he uh, most likely pastored that church for a season in his own life. It says, Under the angel of the church of Ephesus write these things, saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, walketh in the, in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. I know thy works and thy labor and thy patience and how thou canst bear them which are evil. And thou hast tried them, now notice this, thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not and have found them liars. Now this is an interesting statement because God says he liked the fact that this church here tried or proved, same word, tried or proved them that said they were apostles or, or that they were sent. Now that could be any ministry gift really if if you think, think about it, any ministry gift really is sent to the church. So they tried them in this Bible school setting, uh, saying they're apostles, and they found them liars. And he said that was a good thing. So their proving process could actually cause people that said they were called to the ministry to be found out liars. They weren't telling the truth about their calling and tell the truth about their abilities. And, uh, you know, you think that's kind of harsh or a bad thing, but it's really a good thing because that's the way uh, God set, set it up to work. Verse 3, and has borne and has patience for my name's sake and has labored and has not fainted. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee because thou has left thy first love. Verse 5, remember therefore from whence thou art fallen and repent and do the first works or else I will come unto thee quickly and will remove the candlestick out of thy place, except thou repent. It's pretty heavy stuff. Verse 6, But this that thou, that thou hast, this thou hast, that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I hate. All right? Now, I just want to stop there and say the Nicolaitans. All right? He hated the deeds of the Nicolaitans. He didn't hate the Nicolaitans. He hated their deeds. Maybe people are doing some things out here. You know, this new uh, message of uh, grace that seems to be permeating the church, one of the things they believe and talk about a lot is how God is never displeased with you. He always is pleased with you. and He'll never point out your faults and all that kind of stuff. Well, this, this, these chapters of Scripture here refute all that. Uh, he was not pleased with what was going on in the Nicolaitans. He loved the Nicolaitans. They had, uh, again, come out of the church. Some of them really were believers, but their leadership was teaching things that he didn't like. Now, what were they teaching? Well, there's a lot to that. I won't go into everything, but I will say this. They were teaching that since you were born again, it didn't matter what you do with your body. You could just uh, involve yourself in any kind of immorality. It doesn't matter because they're born again. Because they're born again, you can do this. Because you're born again, you can do that. You're under grace. You can do this. You can do that. And that teaching, of course, is creeping back into the church. Um, I mean, they were many of them. It says it's okay to commit fornication. It says it's okay to live with somebody. It says it's okay to be a bisexual or homosexual. And we see that uh, in the church today. Well, Jesus, he hated the deeds of that. He hated their doctrine. Now, uh, if you go down here, let's see if I can find it real quick. Uh, um, with, if you go down to uh, Revelations chapter, let's see, chapter 2, same, same chapter, and you go down to verse uh, uh, verse 15, and he's speaking to the church here of Pergamos. He writes the same thing. So uh, has thou also them that hold the doctrine, see, the doctrine, not just the deeds, but the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, thing of, that I hate. So we see two sets of scriptures here that uh, came out of a mistake when these guys went down, and they actually anointed these guys. Now, uh, there should have been a proving process, and maybe they would have got this out of Nicholas to where he did not yield to an evil spirit and a doctrine of the devil that took a whole bunch of people out into this cultic side of the church. So this is real important. And when we get into this, we're going to go through the proving, the, the scriptures that talk about proving, how it's to be done. But again, Acts chapter 6 never happened again in the church that you see in the epistles. It was always the leadership, the Apostle Paul, Timothy, Titus, leaders that had been trained to oversee the congregations that chose the people for ministry, whether it be deacons 
or bishops, deacons, the, spirit, uh, the natural side of the church, bishops or elders, the spiritual side of the church. I'm not saying a deacon couldn't be an elder, but I'm just saying the, over, the oversight of the other side of the church uh, that were proven by the leaders of the church, all right, the people that were in place in oversight. They watched them carefully to prove themselves. Well, I hope you've enjoyed this. Uh, if you would like to uh, uh, like this a lot, and, you know, share these um, on your Facebook, whatever. Share them with other people because these truths need to be proclaimed from the housetops in those last days of spiritual deception. Make sure that you share them, that you let people know about them, especially young preachers. This will be very helpful to them. I know it was to me when I first started understanding some of these, uh, these great truths. And, uh, you know, if you will, pray about becoming a partner with us. You can go to faithalivefellowship.org, faithalivefellowship.org. That's our website. We have all kinds of stuff going on there. We have uh, free seminars. You can bounce over to our YouTube pages, our Facebook Live pages, all that. And the social media is a big deal now. It, it's really become very much an avid part of our ministry. You can also pray about becoming a partner. You can pray for us and sow seed on a consistent basis. In fact, I encourage you to do so if you watch us and you're constantly getting fed by us that's only right for people to um, uh, you know to sow seed uh, my money and honor us and our ministry that way but I just ask people to pray about that uh, if God uh, we're looking for a thousand partners to stand with us on a, on a monthly basis so we can do much more for the gospel but uh, remember this feed your faith and starve your doubts to death and when you go over to faith life fellowship, we include your prayer requests and we'll pray for you. Until next time, this is Thomas Terry. God bless you. Have a great week.